Well, a very good evening to you and welcome along to our Bible study to Hope Church Gainsborough. I hope that you are well and you've had a good week so far. If you'll remember, we had laid a foundation last week um, to where we are now in Acts chapter 8 as we're looking at Philip and the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. Um, if you didn't catch that, then stop this video and go and have a look at last week so you can get yourself right up to speed. The joy of recording, hey? It means you don't get to miss anything. Um, but we got to Philip. He was one of seven who were picked by the apostles in order to carry out some specific roles within this rapidly growing new thing, new living thing called the church. You remember the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost and we had this church then and this rapid growth. Um, and they're all these uh, seven, the apostles, and then all of these believers are then scattered. If you remember, because uh, Stephen um, was martyred, he was murdered, he was stoned because of his faith and because of his passion for sharing truth. And Philip is one of those that is scattered and he heads off in a certain direction which leads him to Samaria where he is preaching and he's sharing the good news about Jesus Christ. Philip then, as we got to last week, was prompted by an angel of the Lord to a particular spot. He didn't get any more information than that. It was just go to this particular area. Um, and when he got there, the Holy Spirit then prompted him to get close to a chariot and to stay near it. So that's exactly what he does. So we pick the story up. Acts chapter 8 um, starting at verse 26, I've got my Bible in front of me, it says this. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. And on his way home, was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah, the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I? He said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they travelled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptised? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptised him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Astos and travelled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Let's just pray, shall we? Lord, we just want to thank you for the opportunity once again that we've got to be able to look into your word together as your church. We pray, Lord, that tonight that you would encourage us, that you just bless us as we look together, as we learn together, as we grow together. We thank you for your word. We thank you that we have the opportunity to be able to just continue in our study together as a church. Things are different at the minute, Lord, but nevertheless, we're able to do it together. We share together, we learn together and we grow together. And we just thank you for that. We pray, Lord, that tonight that you'll just be with us, that you'll have your hand upon us. 
Just bless us, Lord. Speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. So we finished basically in that moment last week where Philip was just about to speak to the Ethiopian. Um, he's heard the passage of scripture um, and as the, uh, as the eunuch is, is in the chariot, he's reading, Philip hears and then naturally, as the spirit has led him to this point, he wants to share the gospel. The, the piece that, um, of scripture that the eunuch is reading is one of the most important Old Testament passages because it points to the coming Messiah, the suffering Messiah. It points to Jesus Christ. It's an incredible moment. And you can see how in the fabric of time that God has allowed this moment to occur. So much has happened before. We laid that foundation last week. And so much has happened for the Ethiopian, for him to be in this exact spot. It's incredible. It's a, a divine appointment. And it really does show us how in control God is. It's incredible that these are desperate circumstances. Remember, that's what's brought Philip out of Jerusalem. They're desperate moments. The church has been scattered, believers all over. Philip has been preaching, doing what he knows to the best of his ability. But God has hatched a plan for salvation for so many more people, perhaps, than would have been saved in just Jerusalem. Now the church is all over. And, and here, Philip is in a moment where he is preaching to an Ethiopian. We have to ask the question, don't we? Was the scattering of the church a good thing or a bad thing? And I'll leave that up to you as we go through tonight and as we continue to look through the word of God over the coming weeks, God willing. I'll leave that to you to decide, to make up your mind. Was it a good thing or was it a bad thing that the church was scattered? Some geography, some history here now then. The eunuch, obviously, as we can see from Ethiopia, he would be as incredible as this is going to be, a direct descendant of Ham. You might ask, who's Ham? Well, he was one of the sons of Noah. Noah had three sons, as recorded for us in Scripture, Shem, Ham and Japheth. Well, Ham, uh, the Ethiopian here, is a direct descendant of Ham, one of Noah's sons. And you can trace that lineage if you'd like. You can see in Genesis chapter 10, and verse 6 through 20. And that shows us the lineage of Ham. Um, all the way back then, from this moment in Acts, the early church beginning, we go all the way back to Genesis in chapter 10. It's incredible, isn't it? It's absolutely amazing. But trust me when I say this, it gets better. So here, our first significant conversion as we go through Acts is a direct descendant of Ham. Philip hears exactly what this Ethiopian is reading. And he simply asks in verse 30, do you understand what you're reading? Do you understand? You know, it's a, a, wonderful, a wonderfully simple question, but actually... Sometimes the, the simple questions are the questions that get us off to a conversation with people around us. You know, we desperately want to be able to, to share the good news with people, but often the opportunity doesn't seem to arise. We want to be able to tell them about our faith. We want to be able to tell them about who we are. But sometimes we struggle to find a, a right opening without feeling like we're forcing it upon somebody or almost leading the conversation to get to that point. But this simple question that Philip asks leads to a life-changing outcome for this Ethiopian. You see, this man knows about the God of Israel. 
In fact, he's come to Jerusalem on a pilgrimage to worship the God of Israel. But right now, as is very evident, as we see here and as we go through this piece of text, right now, it's just religion for the man. Why do I say that? Well, he's come on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to do what he feels he has to do. And now he's on his way back to his home. It's religion. Because yet, to this point, he doesn't have a relationship with God. It's just rules and regulations. But, by God's grace, it's soon to become a relationship. The very passage, in fact, that the Ethiopian is reading is the reason that there is a way to have a relationship with God. Isn't that amazing? The very thing, I guess, that the man was desiring, he couldn't attain because he didn't know or understand. It was impossible for him. But now he's about to have the scriptures unlocked by Philip because he's reading the very thing that's indeed going to show him that a relationship is possible with a loving Heavenly Father. Now, we know, as we've already seen, we looked earlier in the chapter of, of chapter eight of Acts, that Philip knows how to preach. In fact, when he got to Samaria, that's what indeed he was doing. He was preaching Jesus and the whole town was rejoicing. The whole city, sorry, was rejoicing because, in fact, he was doing and going about um, the Lord's business. What I would say to us, though, church, is we have to take the opportunities. We have to take the opportunities that we're given to share our faith, to share Jesus. And I, as I've already said, sometimes it's difficult to, to spot that opportunity. But here, Philip, it's really clear for him as, as the Lord appears to him and says to him, this is where I want you to go. But Philip, remember, was already preaching and teaching in Samaria. He was already sharing the good news about Jesus. But uh, the Lord wanted him elsewhere. So the Lord said to him, this is where I want you to go. And um, we must take opportunities to share the gospel. We must be attentive to what the Lord wants, to listen, to make sure we are where he wants us to be, that we are ready, that we are, I guess, filled with that, that fire in our bellies, that we want to share with people, that we want to, um, to share our faith, to preach the gospel, just to share the good news about the Lord Jesus Christ. We can't always rely on the preacher, can we? It's not just the preacher's job to share the gospel. It's all of our responsibility. It isn't just mine. It is all of our responsibility. It's not just the preacher at the front. It is the whole church's responsibility to share the gospel. We have to act too. That's why I guess last week, and I, and I hope I didn't intimidate you with it, but but that's why I wanted you to have a look at those chapters in Isaiah so that you could develop your answer that you would give to the Ethiopian, what you would share with him, what you would say to him, because it's good practice for us. You know, I want us as a church to be disciple making disciples. So what that simply means is that I am a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, an adherent to his word. I'm a disciple of Jesus. But it doesn't just stop there. I want to have a relationship with the Lord, which I do on a day to day basis because of my saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. But what I also want to do is to be able to share with others so they, too, might find their uh, their redemption, that they might ask Jesus into their life. They might say sorry for their sin so that they, too, might become disciples. So I, as a disciple, have enabled somebody to see the Lord Jesus Christ. They too have become a disciple, a follower, and they too go on to do exactly the same as what I've done. So we're disciple making disciples. That's the New Testament church. That's how it was working in the beginning of Acts. And by God's grace, that's how it still works today. Often, though, in the, the culture that we live in, we rely heavily on the preacher. 
It's the preacher's job. It's their job to share the gospel. It's their job to share the good news about Jesus. No, it's not. It is, but it isn't just their job. It's, it's your job too. It's all of our responsibility to share the good news, the gospel about Jesus Christ. And what we found ourselves in at the moment is a culture where, you know, I go to church or we go to church, the preaching's amazing or the worship's amazing or the food is just superb. And all those things are great and they will serve God willing to keep people at the church. But how do people come into the church? Well, it's by our testimony to those others. It's our testament to the people around about us. I'd love you to come to church, not because the preacher's amazing, but because what I'm going to do is share life with you. I'm going to share the good news about Jesus with you. And God willing, that person comes to church because they want to hear more. God willing, that person comes to church because you've been able to lead them to the Lord, perhaps when things get back to normal, in your front room, maybe in your garden at the moment, where you just share the good news about Jesus. They want to know more. And naturally then, they want to come along to church. And then what we've done is we've, we, we're disciples, we've made disciples who are going to make disciples. We as a church are disciple making disciples. That is what we want hope church to look like that's what the church does indeed look like all of the things that i've mentioned about the church with the preacher with the worship with the surroundings it's all great and it's all part of it but the key to growth church well is you it's us it's all of us as we share jesus on a day-to-day -day basis we love people on a day-to-day -day basis and by God's grace they see how much they are loved by a heavenly father by the way that we live and act and they want to find Jesus. They ask the Lord into their life and they go on to do as we've done with them. Listen, it's really clear as we look in Romans, if you've got your Bible with you again, Romans chapter 10 and just starting at verse 13. Paul, one of the people that we're going to look at who was Saul um, in the coming weeks. For everyone, verse 13, Romans chapter 10, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear, listen, without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And you might say to yourself tonight, well, I've not been sent to preach that good news. And I'll just remind you of Matthew 28, as Jesus said to his disciples, go out into all the world and preach the gospel. I'll ask you the question tonight, are you a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? By God's grace, the answer would be yes. So let me just go back to Matthew 28. As Jesus said to his disciples, go out into all the world and preach the gospel. Now, I don't want to scare you or to put pressure on you, but naturally we as Christians, we do have a responsibility to share the good news about Jesus Christ. You know, we don't want the church to stagnate. We don't want it to stay at a, at a nice whole number that we feel comfortable with. We don't want to fill the church with people that look and feel just like we do. That's not what church is. We fill the church with all those people who look, who act, who have different interests, different just completely different to how we are. We fill the church by God's grace. We share the good news about Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit then draws people to, to the Lord and therefore people are saved. Now our responsibility is, as the Bible's really clear, is to go out into all the world and to preach the gospel. And we're able to do that by God's grace, aren't we? We're able to do that. And as we look into the word, we can see then that we have a responsibility. And as Paul's told us there in Romans, that we have to share. How can people hear if we, if we don't? If we don't share, how will they know? Look, 
we, we can see too from the word tonight, from this particular account, that God is absolutely interested in the one. So, uh, so often as well, we, we look into the world and we see a great preacher. And there are many, I won't name drop because it's on the internet, but there are many fantastic preachers out there. And as they preach, thousands here. And we've seen over the years that thousands can be converted. Look at Peter's message right at the beginning of Acts. As he preached, 3,000 were added to, that, uh, to the number that particular day. And that's incredible. But let me just assure you too tonight that God is interested in the one. He is absolutely interested in the one. This account gives a very clear picture of that. Philip is doing amazing things in Samaria. But God says to him, I want you to go here. Because I'm interested in the one. There's great joy in the city of Samaria because of what Philip's doing. And God says, no, I want you to go here. Because I'm interested in the one. I'm interested in this Ethiopian this man who is a descendant directly of Ham. You know to church the parable of the lost sheep. God doesn't change. He's always, he always has been and always will be interested in the one. So Philip, naturally, as we see his fervour, his passion for sharing the gospel, even, remember, when oppressed and on the run, he was the man for the job. Why? Well, because he was ready. He was prepared. He was on point. He knew what he was doing. Church, that is, again, something for us to think on, to reflect on. He's ready. He, he knows the word. He's ready to act. That, again, is why I challenged you last week to just write down what you would say to the eunuch, because it's important for us, church, to be ready. Because when we're ready, well, that changes our mentality. Because if I'm ready to share the gospel, I'm looking for an opportunity. If I'm ready to share the gospel, I'm excited at the prospect of an opportunity. But it's only when I'm ready, am I looking, am I excited? I have to be ready first. And we can get ourselves ready. How? Well, by looking at the word, by reading the word, by studying the word, by listening, by tuning in, by engaging in the word and seeing what the Lord's got to say to us. That's how we ready ourselves. We pray, we look, we seek, we learn, we grow, we ready ourselves for doing what God has called us to do. Philip was absolutely the man for the task. And I don't want us to get scared at this point, you know, just to turn me off because whew, it's a bit, it's a little bit much asking us to do this, that and the other. That's not it. I'm not trying to put pressure on you at all. I'm just showing you what the word says and what the Holy Spirit does with that. Well, then that's what happens. For me, my job is just to share the word and, and for the word to show us clearly that that's what God wants us to do. Being ready is absolutely key, church, to our growth. And I, I do think that you might think over the coming weeks, I sound a little bit like a broken record, but I want us to hone in on this. As we go through these conversions over the coming weeks, God willing, it's important for us to note that these conversions happen because people were willing to share. And we'll see as we come to Saul that actually that willingness was a little bit, it was held back. We'll also see with Cornelius as we move further through the scripture that actually that willingness was almost held back. We have to come to those points where those boundaries, those restrictions seem to be, where those walls have been placed. And we, we pray, we ask the Lord to break those walls down. Lord, help me to get ready. I don't even know what ready looks like, Lord. I wouldn't even know where to start by sharing the gospel. I'd be petrified. What would I say? I'd be scared I made a mistake. These are the things that we should be praying into and say, Lord, help me with whatever they are. That might be all of them. 
but we, we pray into that and we ask the Lord to help us. It's a great challenge for us, church. We, as I've already said, we don't want to stagnate. No, we do not at all. We want to continue to push forward and being ready is the key. So back to um, Acts chapter 8 and verse 36. The eunuch heard the message as Philip just laid the scriptures out for him, laid out the good news about Jesus Christ. He heard the message. He believed in the Lord Jesus and he obviously professed and repented. Um, and he knew then that he should get baptised. Um, we can see, let's just have a read of verse 36 and then I'll point something out that you, you may have missed. As they travelled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of me being baptised? Now you'll look, we've read 36 in your NIV, if that's what you're reading from, and you'll see it jumps straight to verse 38. Now they've omitted verse 37. And the reason being is there's only a few manuscripts that actually place this um, this verse in, if you like. The verse have been added later, but this, this portion of text in. And basically it says, um, if you believe, this, this would be the missing piece, if you believe with all your heart, you may, the eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, you see, that's been omitted because it's not in all of the manuscripts. So they can't prove that it hasn't just been written by a scribe, perhaps, because he felt like it should be there. Um, so it's been left out. But naturally, we can assume that um, because Philip was willing to baptise uh, the Ethiopian, that naturally the Ethiopian had professed his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and he, uh, he says in verse 38, the, the eunuch then, and he gave orders to stop the chariot. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptised him. What a moment. You know, you think about that. And Philip's been called from a place where he was doing a great work. And I want you to go here. And when he gets there, there's just one. You know, perhaps he thought to himself, all of this way just for the one. But you never see Philip complain. He was just ready to do what the Lord wanted him to do. And, and he's absolutely on point with delivering his message. And, and the, the eunuch obviously believes and asks the Lord into his heart and is indeed baptised as well. It's just incredible. It's an amazing account. Um, the man naturally, as we've already seen, he's on his way back from a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. A religious pilgrimage. And he goes from religion to relationship in just a few verses, just the one encounter, one divine appointment that God said, I'm interested in the one. This is the one. Go seek him out and go and tell him about what Jesus has done on the cross for him. It's amazing, isn't it? From religion to relationship, from lost to found. From slave to free. That, church, is the power of the gospel, isn't it? That is the power of the gospel. And then as quick as Philip arrived on the scene, he was led away by the Spirit. We see that in verse 39. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. The eunuch did not see him again, but listen but went on his way rejoicing. The man had found salvation. The man had found freedom. The man had found life. As Philip showed him, the man had a passion to learn. He had a passion and a desire to follow the Lord, but didn't know what it looked like. And Philip enlightened him. Philip told him. The Holy Spirit drew him to that point. Philip shared and the eunuch received salvation. Just for the one, church, just for the one, God is absolutely interested. He saved me. He saved you. We all, don't we, have someone in our life who showed us the Lord Jesus. Somebody who shared the gospel. Somebody who took time out for the one. Somebody who just took time out to share the good news. Now, the question for us is, who will we show? 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we again just want to thank you so much that we've been able to look into your word together. Father, we thank you for the power of the gospel. We thank you, Lord, for the life changing good news that the Lord Jesus Christ came to take our place on the cross. And Father, we thank you that there he dealt with our sin and our shame. But Father, as he was punished for our transgressions, Father, as he was placed in that tomb, death could not hold him. And Father, we celebrate that in him, that through him, we have life, we have life eternal. Father, we are saved because of what the Lord Jesus has done for us. And we just pray, Lord, that you would help us as your church to be disciple-making disciples, that we would be ready to share that good news with people around about us. Father, draw us to your word, that your Holy Spirit would draw us to learn and to grow and to study. Father, we just thank you that we have the opportunity. So, we, Lord, we just ask that you continue to be with us, bless us, strengthen us, we pray. We ask these prayers in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So thank you so much, Church, for joining with me again online, for joining us, Hope Church. And I just pray that you just continue to look into the Word. I look forward to seeing you very soon. Keep safe, keep in the Word, and we'll see you very soon. God bless.